We continue our series on Jesus, myth, madman, Messiah, with words from Jesus that are challenging and often difficult. Hear God's word for us this morning as we read from the fifth chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He calls his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Almighty God, what a special morning. Lord, I pray that in the busyness and the hustle and the sitting in different seats, all the things that have gone into this morning, that you can quiet our spirits, that you can give us ears that hear your voice and your voice alone, that no matter what words are spoken, what we hear are the words you want spoken into our souls. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice so clearly that we can't wait to be who you call us to be. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We're in the third week of a challenging and yet very timely, I think, sermon series titled Jesus, Myth, Madman, or Messiah. In the first week, Pastor Stan started off by uh, beginning with the historical evidence for Jesus, uh, both those things that are found in historical texts, but also looking at the lives that were changed, the men that, that walked the journey with Jesus, so that to the point they believed in him that, that after Jesus died, they continued to spread his revolutionary message, even at a risk to their own lives. That truly talks about truth that was spoken into them. Last week he talked about how Jesus left the holy to take on human form, to come and walk this earth so that we can have an intimate example of how much God loves us, but also so that we would have a living example of how we're called to live um, as, as disciples of Jesus, as people of God. And this week, we're looking at some of the sayings of Jesus um, and, and some of those things that make us ask, did he really say that? And I was in drama when I was in high school, and one of the exercises they did is they would have us say the same sentence three different ways, and we would just put a different emphasis, put the emphasis on a different word. And so we're kind of asking that. We're really asking two questions today. We're going to say, did he really say that? But we're also going to say, ask the question, did Jesus really say that? Is there, is it, can, we, can we bank on the fact that it was Jesus who said it? And did he really say what it says in the text? Because some of it's pretty crazy. So I hope you enjoy this journey as much as, as I have this week, as challenging as it has been. I told a story in, in the sermon preview that some of you would have gotten about my first week that where I worked as a, as a professional youth worker. I was actually getting paid to, to do this job. And um, I walked in, kind of green. It was my first week, and I was going to sit in on all the different small groups. And one of the first small groups I sat in, the lady said, don't talk, which those of you who know me, that's very difficult for me to do, but I, I was going to do it. So she proceeds. She reads this portion of Scripture. And she gets to the end of it, and she said, but Jesus would never say that, so we don't have to pay attention to that. And then, now let's go on. And I just went, oh, um. And, and you know, I wasn't supposed to say anything, so I tried not to, but she gave me permission, so we did. But the passage that she was, um, had read to the kids is a difficult one. It's, it's Matthew 10, and this is from when Jesus sent out the 12 out into the world to uh, begin preaching. And he begins the passage by saying, now you're only supposed to go to those Jews that have kind of lost their ways. Don't go to the Gentiles, which means everyone who's not a Jew, and don't go n into any town that has Samaritans. And then he says, tell them, preach to them that the kingdom of heaven has come near, and, and you're supposed to heal the sick, raise the dead, um, 
cleanse the lepers and drive out demons. And not only that, don't take any supplies with you. Um, and and that when they got to the village, they were supposed to look around and they were supposed to find someone who was worthy and enter their house. And when he entered their house, he was supposed to say, um, give them blessings and offer peace to the house. But if the house was undeserving, it said, then leave immediately, wipe the dust from your feet and move on and go to the next town. What challenged the, um, what the, the small group leader was struggling with the most was the very beginning of that statement. When Jesus said, go here, but don't go to these people. And then the end, when she said, and if they don't like it, just move on and, and forget about them. For her, she had, she had this vision of Jesus as being one who is inclusive, not exclusive. And so for her, she just couldn't make sense of the passage and had to move on. I can understand her struggle um, because she could put what, what was said in that one statement against the times when Jesus did call Samaritans to be leaders in evangelism. When he made a Samaritan the head uh, or the hero in one of the parables. And, and he, times when he did miracles with the Gentiles. So clearly, how do you, how do you match these two up? And, and I understand her struggle. I struggle with the portion of that passage, and then there's other scriptures that I, to this day, continue to wrestle with and ask God, um, what could you mean there? And this does bring us to our first point to ponder, which is reading Jesus' words forces us to think, and it encourages us to act. I don't believe there will ever be a time while we are on this planet, while we're in this world, where we get to disengage our brain when we read scripture. I think we are constantly invited to struggle. When we read this passage, it says that Jesus called his disciples to be choosy. Um, if we read it in its entirety, the passage right before chapter 9, um, Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And in original text, when you roll the scrolls out, there aren't chapters, there aren't verses, there aren't uh, breaks where they say this portion goes together and this portion goes together. So if you read it that way from chapter 9, Jesus says there's a lot of work to do and there aren't that many of us. And then they give a little list of who the disciples are and he says, so here's how we're going to do it. And then he gives them these instructions to go out. So what's happening in, in that particular part part of the scripture is that they had a lot of work to do and very limited resources. So they needed their actions to be as effective and efficient as possible to launch this brand new ministry. In context, Jesus is giving great um, explanations or instructions in how to, to begin a new ministry. For me, the more challenging statement is what Jesus tells them to preach. Jesus says, go and tell them if, that, that the kingdom of heaven is near. And if the kingdom of heaven was near back then, when, when I read the scripture, then I have to wonder, is the kingdom of heaven near now? Can we proclaim the same message? Are we called to proclaim the same message today? And when we read the, Jesus' words and we think about what Jesus was saying to them, then we're compelled to act. We're compelled to go. The harvest is plentiful. We can see that today as, as we look at our 27 conferences that are going to come forward. But outside these walls, how many people are not yet in a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ? There are so many examples of Jesus saying things in the scripture, things that just make you go, make many people throughout history wonder, was he a madman? Was he crazy? I started to list them all, um, and then I, I just got overwhelmed because it would have taken us days or weeks or years to work through those and unpack what Jesus might have meant. So we're going to move on with an invitation to join a small group where you can struggle with some of those scriptures together, but that's just a plug. So I'm going to move on to the second question, which is, uh, did Jesus really say something like that? This was our scripture that Jesus expected us to follow. And as I read through it, I stop at a few statements. Uh, number one, does God have any idea how hard it is to love our enemies? Well, as soon as I asked that question, I realized, of course God does. Because the Pharisees were constantly trying to, to trick Jesus, to kill Jesus, 
to have him arrested. Judas, one of his best friends, betrayed him. And yet, Christ loved them and prayed for them. So yes, God has an idea of how hard that is. The second thing that makes me wonder is why does God cause the sun to rise on the evil just like he does a good? Why does God send the rain to people who don't deserve it? My response is much like my children's response. That's not fair. And then the last one, the one that really gets me. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is one of those scriptures that we talked about in confirmation, and we went, what does that mean? As hard as that is, as hard as it is to imagine, the idea of being perfect, as much as I want to be perfect, I know, no matter how hard that is, that this scripture is life-giving. That this scripture is true. It is only by loving our enemies that we're able to understand how much God loves us. How we can fully experience God's grace poured out on us. When we accept that God is present in the life of those who hurt us, those who are doing the wrong thing, that God is still working and moving in them. That's when we have an opportunity to move past judgment and condemnation. And then when we accept that God is calling us to be perfect, see right there I just get stuck every time. But what I realize is that God says you can do better. I am with you. And this is something to strive for. We never say, well that's too tough. God can't really want me to do that that I really am called to love my enemies. One thing I've learned as I've struggled and struggled and struggled with scripture is that studying Jesus' words takes a lot of time and it causes me to examine my life every day. This morning is, a, is an exciting time in our church because we have 27 young people who began a journey nine months ago back in September, to truly examine their faith. And over the past nine months, they have studied scripture, a lot of scripture. They have explored subjects, Listen to some of the things that, that these kids have talked about this past year, sin, the sacraments, prevenient justifying and sanctifying grace, social justice, their roles as disciples of Christ and ministers in the church, and they've contemplated, discussed, worked out the vows that they're going to take today. Today, they will publicly claim that they choose Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they understand that this means that God has a plan for them, that God has a plan for this world, and that because Jesus is Lord, God's plan goes. That we're called to step into that plan and to be who God calls us to be. As a congregation, we're going to be invited to think through and recommit ourselves to those same vows. Reading Jesus' words causes us to think. Studying Jesus' words takes time and causes us to contemplate changing. And understanding Jesus' words is difficult. Jesus was brilliant and scary and inspiring and most definitely not normal. Jesus taught us things that the world doesn't agree with, that the world doesn't say makes that the world says doesn't make sense and definitely doesn't understand. But understanding Jesus' words is possible with the Holy Spirit. In John 14:26 Jesus says, "But the advocate the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will, re will remind you of everything that I have said to you. When we read the scripture, we invite the Holy Spirit to help us understand the truth that God is trying to teach us through the words of Jesus and through scripture. One thing I know for sure 
God doesn't want to hide from us. God wants to be revealed to us and through us. But God and God's words are not easy to understand, and I'm really thankful for that. I'm thankful that the God that I worship and I trust is so much bigger than my brain can comprehend. But I'm also good, uh, glad that God offers me an opportunity to understand those things that are, um, at some points, seem somewhat crazy. Understanding Jesus' words is also an exciting journey. One thing I know for sure is that reading, studying, and understanding Scripture makes life exciting. Never a dull moment, never boring, when you're trying your very best to live the way God wants you to live. Today our confirmands are taking a giant step in their journey of faith. We celebrate the work that they've put in to get where they are today. We've said many times throughout confirmation that the confirmation is not a golden ticket to heaven, that this isn't a destination or the end of the journey, but, but in fact this is more of a passport that opens up this great adventure of discipleship. As we celebrate the work that they've done, the accomplishments that they've made, we continue to pray for them, for the journey that they will take from this day forward, for the struggle, the joy, and the life. In the bulletin, you'll find the confirmand's names. I invite you to take that home. Keep it in your Bible. Keep it somewhere where every once in a while it'll fall out, and you'll remember to pray again for these kids that are on a lifelong journey. And when you see it, I hope it's a, also a reminder that each of us is on that same journey. That every one of us is called to examine our life, our interaction with God's Word, and this journey that we're on. I hope we continue to dive into Scripture, to study it in such a way that we, we really struggle that we find things that make us wonder. That maybe make us wonder if, if Jesus was a little bit crazy in asking us to do that. But then I also hope, pray, that we are so filled by that spirit, by that scripture, that it calls us and compels us to step out into that crazy world of faith. I pray that each and every one of us experiences the joy and the passion that hearing, studying, and understanding God's Word can bring to us. It's a lifelong journey, and it's exciting. Let's pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your Word. We give you thanks for the people that you have put in our lives that have proclaimed your message to us, that have taught us about your love, taught us about uh, what it means to be in relationship with you. I pray, Lord, that as we hear these words, that as we reflect on your scripture, that we experience new life. I pray that as we go through the baptisms and confirmations today, that each of us hears your voice call us deeper, farther along our walk. We give you thanks, Lord, that you love us. Help us to love others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.